Hello, here we are again. Uh, this week we have a reading from Mark chapter 5 verses 21 to 45 about a girl restored to life and a woman healed. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him and he was by the lake. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came and when he saw him fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death, come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw the commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, come which means little girl get up and immediately the girl got up and began to walk about she was 12 years of age at this they were overcome with amazement he strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat well what a lot of miraculous activity is contained in this fifth chapter of mark's gospel just another day in the office for Jesus. Like a politician on a whistle-stop tour, Jesus crossed Galilee, freed someone oppressed by demons, and in our reading, crosses back and is met by a huge crowd and another request for healing. When I was a teacher, I remember my class of six-year-olds clustering around me, all with news or needs. Sir, sir, sir. And then, when I was a social worker with a full caseload, there was a certain amount of trepidation at team meetings because one would inevitably be allocated more cases. In all the jobs I have had, there has been pressure, letters, phone calls, emails, tasks, deadlines, missed deadlines. The work just keeps stacking up. I expect you've had similar experiences. Perhaps Jesus, had rest and recuperation during the sea crossing. After all, there's no reference to Jesus ever rowing himself. In our story, Jesus is met by a crowd, including a man with a dying daughter and a woman with a chronic condition, both desperate for healing. Jesus responds directly to Jairus's plea for help. And it is only when Jesus eventually takes the little girl's hand that she is revived to help. The woman, on the other hand, seems to help herself to her healing, 
By faith she touches Jesus' clothes, not even his hand, and she is healed. The woman had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years, and this made her ritually unclean, and anything or anybody she touched would also be ritually unclean. And this is all under the law found in Leviticus chapter 15. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, for all the days of the discharge, she shall continue in uncleanness. She shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies during all the days of her discharge shall be treated as the bed of her impurity, and everything upon which she sits shall be unclean. Whoever touches these things shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until the evening. Wow. Well, I won't go into all the mosaic purity laws or touch on issues of misogyny, but suffice it to say, Jesus appears to have taken no regard to them. What we do notice is that Jesus was busy healing people. His compassion never seems to be exhausted. People trusted that Jesus would answer their pleas and heal them. And there's no record of his ever refusing. A plea is the same as a prayer. We are urged to pray in Matthew 21. Whatever you ask for in prayer with faith, you will receive. Mark 11, so I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Paul in Philippians urges his readers not to worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. As an instruction manual, this is simple, ask and you will get what you ask for. Prayer in a slot at the top, and ka -ching, the answer pops out. God, the almighty vending machine. <laughs> Not so simple. You, like me, must have prayed for lots of situations, illnesses, calamities, where there was no change in the outward circumstances. Over the last 2,000 years, we Christians have come up with a lot of explanations as to why this happens. We lack faith, we doubt, we have unbelief, we lack persistence or patience. It's not in God's plan, it's his, not in his will or timing. It's our sins that stop God answering. Hypocrisy, pride, rudeness, unforgiveness, malice, anger, wrath, divisiveness, or doing really evil things. We pray wrongly to gratify our selfish desires, or we're not fasting, or not using the right form of words. We pray for things where a yes is impossible. Or sometimes God is just testing us. On and on the reasons pile up. But it boils down to unanswered prayers being our fault or our ignorance. After all, God knows our needs, is all powerful and willing that we have fullness of life. I have to say I struggle with this and I don't have sufficient clarity on what might be wisdom on this so what I say might not be helpful but it seems odd that someone can thank God for finding them a parking space but that millions praying for deliverance from Nazi death camps or Stalinist purges have had their prayers unanswered. Personally I found that much of my prayer is dutiful, perfunctory something I ought to do. The sudden shock and turmoil of disaster, fear, illness of loved ones physically shakes us. I remember when my four-year-old son was desperately ill in hospital for weeks. How we prayed. How unhelpfully someone suggested demons were involved. I remember a couple who had similar experiences gently telling us we couldn't force a healing from God and had to trust and wait for whatever the outcome would be. I'm prepared to accept 
there is something mysterious I don't understand, and that there is something more than wishful thinking or confirmation bias at work. However, I also think that we have misunderstood prayer, or at least I have. When Jesus taught about prayer, he said we should talk to our daddy, our papa, Abba, our father, all people's father, not just of Christians. Prayer is about relationship. Prayer is a conversation, not a begging letter. We ask that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer helps us understand what earth should be like and the doing or making earth like heaven is down to us. Making peace, achieving justice, feeding the hungry, rescuing the oppressed, clothing the naked, housing the homeless, and yes, healing the sick. When we pray, give us our daily bread, forgive us our sins. Do not bring us to the test. We are not praying for my bread, my sins, my leading. I'm included in the us, but we are praying as a community where one suffers, we all suffer. It seems to me that God is inviting us into a partnership of contending for the kingdom. St. Paul advises that all that counts is faith working through love. When we pray for the Rohingya or Ouija, we invite everyone to share that concern and by our attitude and actions, we can be part of the answer. After all, we can't ask God to do something we are unwilling to do ourselves. Someone has to be the answer to prayer. At different times and places, it will be you, me, us.